Okay, so thanks all for joining us online and thanks to Gloriana uh, for organizing this. So uh, today I'm talking about Habibi, which is a multi-dialect, multinational um, Arabic song lyrics corpus that was recently published at ELREC 2020 and is now available in the proceedings. So today's talk is mainly an overview about the corpus, how it was created, why do we need um, Arabic song lyrics and Due to time limitation, I won't have enough time to talk about the experiments in details or show any results. But I'm happy to discuss that at a later time with anyone who's interested. OK, um, so what is Habibi Corpus? So Habibi is a corpus of more than 30,000 Arabic song lyrics. And um, the corpus is split into six Arabic dialects and singers coming from 18 Arab countries from the 22 Arab world countries. And the corpus spans over um, or covers a, a, like a, a, a time of over 100 years worth of song lyrics that is from 1914 to 2019 with the first song uh, available in this corpus goes back to 1914 by Said Darwish, which is the guy at the bottom left of the um, screen. OK, so what does Habibi mean? So Habibi, which means my love, also means my darling, depends on the context. The literal translation could be something like my one who is loved. And although is a masculine, um, Habibi is technically correct to describe both women and men. But in general, um, Habib T with the TI added to the end is a colloquial way um, to tack on a female gender at the ending to make it clear the speaker is talking about or to a woman. But as I said, Habibi is the technically correct term for both genders. So why do we call it Habibi or why did I call the corpus Habibi? So analyzing song titles, I found that Habibi is the most frequent word appearing in more than 35% of Habibi's 30,000 30, song titles. So yeah, it seems like the whole Arab country, like uh, Arab world is in love and that's why the titles actually contains this, but that's actually what um, like, pushed me towards choosing this title and it's mainly like frequency. Oh, and I forgot to say that on the right hand side there is a word cloud and in there you can see even though if you don't even if you don't read Arabic so Habibi is the one in the middle like big font um, in green and that's a significant word uh, if you know about word clouds and this is where the selection came from. So some basic statistics about the corpus. So Habibi is made of more than uh, 30,000 Arabic song. Each song has a title, so we have more than uh, 30,000 30, song titles. And they are split into sentences of more than half a million sentence with words, more than 3.5 million words. So the singers total um, up to more than 1,700 singers. The songwriters, and they are also important, uh, nearly 4,000 songwriters and composers for those interested later on about how words rhyme and all these things are also included. But the information about the country and dialect is only associated with the singers themselves. So as I said, the singers come from 18 Arab countries and I divided them into six main dialects, as I'm going to explain later. So this is a map showing the word count by country for each of the songs, uh, for each country for the songs in the corpus. So the darker the color, the more word count in there. And as we can see, countries like um, Egypt and Saudi Arabia has the maximum number of word counts. And later on, we will see that they are the top two dialects uh, and the top two countries with the number, like in terms of the number of songs. So how big is the Arabic music industry? I thought I need to explain this a little bit in order to understand why do we need to study Arabic uh, song lyrics. So there are more than 400 million speakers or Arabic speakers worldwide. And MENA, which is the Middle East and Northern Africa, are now commanding attention uh, when it comes to global music industry. 
And with that, we see that Arab songs are now featuring in giant online music streaming, such as Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, and Deezer. And Arabic streaming platforms such as Angami, which is also similar to like Spotify and iTunes, but it's local to the uh, Middle East, now has more than 40 million subscribers. And finally, some singers in the Arab world has sold millions of records with, for example, Shep Khaled selling um, more than 80 million albums in his career, and he's actually still singing. Okay, so Arabic versus Western music. This is also important to understand the scope of this paper, which is mainly about classification. So Arabic songs to start with are poorly classified. So the majority are classified under Arabic pop genre, and that's what is called Franco-Arabic, which is basically Arabic song lyrics with Western music. So unlike the Western music that is classified into like pop and rock and metal, Arabic genres do differ and usually fall into categories that better describe the region, the dialect or country of origin of the singer, rather than the type of music. This shows that the lyrics themselves have a bigger weight than the music in the Arab world, and that's why the classification to start with is actually fallen into the singer themselves, their dialects or their country of origin. So why do we need to study Arabic song lyrics? I have two slides on this one because I think it's important to understand what is it about Arabic song lyrics that we need to study. So to start, lyrics are the words that make up a song. They consist of verses and choruses, but even though they are language, Arabic song lyrics are rarely viewed as an object of study and analysis or the microscope into the broader culture. And despite the common misconception, research found dialectical Arabic hip hop songs to use local themes in addition to offering explanation and context um, to the historical and cultural background of the Arabic region. So it is actually important to understand what's going on in those lyrics. So, as most Arab singers sing in their own dialects, Arabic songs need to be viewed differently. As Akhil said in 2012, they need to be viewed as art, as culture, as history, as philosophy, as group identity, as the way of words, and most importantly, as the actual voices of people, because that's actually what people speak. This is their own dialects, and that's what they sing in, and I think it's worth looking into. So Arabic lyrics through Habibi Corpus offer a great venue to understand how Arabic language and its variations evolved over time, because we have data on a period more than 100 years old. So this helps taking lyrics seriously as a complex form of verbal art that has been unjustly neglected in the literature. So Habibi Corpus is the, free, is the first freely available corpus of Arabic song lyrics. The 3.5 million word corpus is available as an annotated data set. And the corpus is split into sentences following the original split offered by the songwriters themselves. So the, like the, the error rate here is low because we, we followed the original split of sentences, which basically the verses in those songs or like song uh, poems. So the corpus is available as annotated plain text, JSON, XML, and CSV file formats. And what's special about it is that it's clean, it's noise-free and well-formatted data that actually rhymes. So unlike data collected from Twitter or online, there is no noise, there's no hashtags or like links or uh, symbols that we do not want to see in the data rather than a clean, only focus on one domain, which is actually the music or like the singing domain. So on the right hand side, this is an example of a plain text file format that has been annotated with information related to the song. So as we can see, we have information related to the song, the song title, um, and who wrote this, who composed it. And the important part is the dialect and the nationality, and both of them are associated with the singer themselves. And then we have the lyrics, uh, like as a block of text and also split into sentences, 
uh, with one verse on a like a sentence tag, as you can see on the right hand side. OK, so to create the corpus, I used web as a corpus technique, um, and that's the method by Kilgariff and Greffenstead. So not exactly the same. I just didn't go and collect anything that I could find online, but I did use the web as my source to find information about um, like lyrics. So it's basically searching for words, something like related to lyrics, um, like the list of singers available in the Middle East and what songs they have online. And after collecting that, I used Google and Wikipedia to automatically extract details about each singer's country of origin, because that's important for us in order to later uh, group the countries into six main dialects. And those are Gulf, Egyptian, Levantine, Iraqi, Sudanese um, and Maghribi. And those six dialects were mainly like following suit with all the literature on Arabic dialect identification um, in previous conferences. All right, so as with many other dialectical Arabic data sets available online, the vocabularies of this data set do overlap. And this is mainly to singers singing in other dialects to gain more fans. So we've got many singers from like um, the Levantines, uh, region singing in Egyptian and vice versa. This is just the way of trying to reach as many listeners um, within the 400 million speakers worldwide. So you need to like hit all these kind of dialects to gain more fans and to gain more popu uh, popularity. So in this chart, in these charts, I'm going to show the differences and the distribution of the data set. So in the first one, I show the distribution of songs by dialect and you can tell it's somehow imbalanced. So we got like the Gulf having so many songs compared to Maghribi and then followed by Egyptian and Levantine. But it's worth saying that the Gulf region is actually made of more than one country. It's actually six countries where Egypt is just one nation. And then we have the Levantine area with, again, more countries compared to Iraq, which is, again, one nation. So the distribution looks kind of imbalanced. But if we look on the right hand side, when we look at the unique vocabularies of each dialect or like the songs of each dialect, we can see some kind of balance in there. So um, like dialects such as Sudanese and Maghribi Maghreb is actually the North African one. So when we look at it, now we can see there is some kind of uniqueness in there that will help like machine classifiers to automatically classify those dialects uh, or like songs into those dialects. So there is some uniqueness there that is not available in any of the other dialects. So this is what makes my data set kind of balanced and worth um, applying NLP and machine learning techniques on. All right, so this is just a very basic example of what we can get from the corpus. So this is just the most frequent words in the song lyrics themselves. And with a quick look, you can tell what the Middle East is singing about. And that's very important. That's just a simple example of what you can do with language. You can analyze language, get information, um, like group like songs together into like certain genres, and we can see here, it doesn't matter if the song is happy or sad, people are talking about their feelings. And this is just one basic example. More can be done with this data set and more analysis uh, can be like, can show that show us like more hidden knowledge that we don't know about. So to experiment with the data set, I used two different um, techniques. So the first one, I applied dialectical or dialect identification, and this is basically classifying the text into dialects on different levels. So I started with the top two, which is a binary classification of the two most frequent um, dialects, and that is Gulf and Egyptian. Then I went into top N uh, level, which is three, four, and five way classification. And finally, classify the songs into all the six dialects. Um, and that's like supposed to be the one with the like the, the one that is more challenging. 
So on a separate level, so I went into country of origin identification, and that's just because I have the information about the country of origin of each singer. So I could classify the text into country of origin on different levels. Again, following suit with the previous one, I went with the top two binary classification of the top two countries, which is Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Then top N, which is three, four, and five way classification. And then all N, so all 18 countries uh, been used to classify. And although that sounds very challenging, the machine learning results showed promising results that is capable of automatically classifying the songs into different countries. So more experiments can be done in here, more classification if you want to take into consideration the songwriters or the composers uh, because of the way the data set is um, like split. So for that I used machine learning. So two types of machine learning. The first one is the classical machine learning algorithms such as naive Bayes logistic regression support vector machine. And I also used deep learning, so convolutional neural network, and long short term memory, LSTM, by LSTM, CLSTM, and by GRU. And as I said, due to like time limitation, I won't have time to go into details about what I've done in those uh, like uh, experiments or show any results, but they are all available in the paper. The source code for these um, deep learning techniques is cited in the paper if you want to go and find the original author of those um, uh, like algorithms. But again, if you go through them and you have any question, you can just email me or ping me with questions or suggestions and I'll be happy to answer. And um, with the deep learning, I also used word embeddings. So I used two continuous uh, bag of words embeddings uh, like SIBOs. So the first one is the in-house Habibi word embeddings and that is a SIBO with uh, 300 dimensions using the full corpus of Habibi. The second one is fast text pre-trained word embeddings, and that is the one trained on Wikipedia Arabic articles, again, 300 dimension. So I'm making the um, Habibi word embeddings freely available with the corpus, uh, and I'm going to show the link in the next slide. Uh, so that's it, that's what I've done in those experiments just to show that the corpus is actually ready to be um, experiment on or with and you are welcome to like experiment more in the corpus and try to extract more information from it or even add to it to try and expand it. So that's it for my talk. So I just want to say that the corpus is freely available to download and experiment with. So there is a direct link on our website uh, where you can download the corpus in its all different formats. So plain text file format, CSVs, JSON or XML. And I've also divided the corpus into different levels. So you'll find it like um, organized by the dialects themselves or the country of origin um, of the singers. Um, so the paper and results are available in LREC 2020 proceedings, but you can also like uh, find the paper on, our, on my website using the Bentley link here. I try to put a short link uh, if you want to write it down, but I'm happy to like add it in the chat. So um, for any for any questions, just email me or ping me on Twitter. And um, I just want to say thank you very much for listening and for being here today. Appreciate that. Happy to take any questions now. Yeah, thanks, Mo. Really interesting. Um, so let's see if there are any questions. I'm going to paste the link in there. Yeah. Um, I actually have a question. I was wondering, um, is it, uh, do you assign one dialect per country and one dialect per singer, or um, could a singer use a different dialect in different Songs. Yeah, so for the for the countries, um, so there is in one of the papers there is a map that shows how the dialects actually dis like distribute across the countries. So you'll find many countries like the Gulf region are all classified under one dialect that is called Gulf. 
and the same thing with North Africa. But for the singers, as I said, they do sing in different dialects. And this is a bit hard and tricky to capture and hear um, unless more experiment is done with the corpus. So for now, each singer, uh, based on their country of origin, is given a certain dialect uh, based on the, the, like, uh, the um, grouping that I've done in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and is there actually also code switching happening within songs? So is a song usually in one dialect or could that also be mixed? Yes, yeah, so, um, as I said, it's because there isn't one certain genre that the singers follow. They try to like do whatever they can to attract more um, audience uh, from, from around the world. So there are so many songs that actually has a lot of code switching. So they switch between dialects. But also we have the rhyme problem. So um, even the poet themselves or the songwriters, to make this song rhyme, they will use another word from another dialect that fits in better than the ones they have in their own dialect because it sounds better, it sounds more musical. Okay. There's a question in the chat. Oh, yes. Yeah. Hello, Huda. So, uh, yes, I there is. Zoom this account. I could not get Teams to work. We use Zoom in here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so for yes, there are a lot of songs in uh, modern standard Arabic, but I didn't include that as a dialect because it's very hard to tell which region actually speaks MSA and it's very spread about. So uh, yes, there, you'll find a lot of songs, especially the old ones by famous poets, uh, written in modern standard Arabic. And then they keep uh, being sang by different singers around the Arab world. So no, for that one, I did not classify into MSA, but it'll be interesting to see if someone can uh, pick those up from the data set. Yeah, I have another question. Sorry, maybe. Uh, is that fine? That's okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, the other question is about these lyrics. Usually we can find them online associated with an English translation, a French or any other language. Did you think of getting those as well and like build kind of parallel data that we can use to do machine translation, for example, knowing how scarce and how rare this kind of data is? Yeah, I did try to be honest, but there isn't, <laughs> there isn't one format or one website that you can find such information. And most of them are very bad translations. Uh, not because of the like the quality of the translator themselves. It's just because of the way these songs are written. They always refer to something rather than being directly or literally translated, or, or can be literally translated into another country. So the like the translation always comes up as weak. But it'll be interesting to find um, like a data set that can have a translation. Maybe we can start with automatic translators now. Thank you, Mahmoud. And then there is one more question by Andrew, I guess, which we can take before we move on. Okay. Yeah, comes for the presentation. Um, I'm just curious, is this kind of more like a proxy for author identification? Because if you say that sometimes they put a dialect, a word dialect to make the song lyric work, then it's a different, then you're identifying a different, you're, you're labeling a thing with one dialect when there are other dialects in there, which is kind of like code switching, as you say. Yeah. But also, then the other thing is, is it is the song, even though it's sang by the person who sung it, but it's written by someone else, is it, are you more identifying the dialect of the songwriter rather than the singer? Yeah, actually, th this is the question that I ask myself a lot while writing the paper. So to begin with, the the original, if we are looking at authorship, identification or attribution, we need to look at the songwriters, actually, not the singers themselves, because, as you said, they could write the songs and it's up to whoever singer to sing it in whatever dialect they want, because there's no restrictions. So if, if we're looking at the authorship, then definitely the songwriters. And um, the the other one you asked, I forgot what that what was the other one. He said something about the. Um, it was just yeah, uh, like, oh, that's switching. Yeah. So the yeah. So the, it's the same thing. So the reason I went with um, singer identification, it's because 
I was trying to see if we can have an assumption like if this singer is from Egypt, will they sing the majority of their songs in their own dialect? And from the results, this is actually possible. You can still identify the dialect of the singer, even if they still sing in other dialects, because it's like having a corpus um, and, a, and a data set that you want to classify and it still contains um, other dialects, but you can still figure out the major kind of dialect out of there. That's the, the, the try, yeah. Yeah, that makes, that makes complete sense. Thanks, Sandra. Okay, so we have one more risen hand, but I think um, to be fair with Ignatius, we should move on. Um, so maybe uh, if there's time in the end, we can have that question or otherwise um, get in contact with Mahmoud directly. Yeah, that's totally fine. Okay. Right, thanks um, a lot. Yeah, thank you.